In this talk, I'll be assuming that we have a large scale, perfectly functioning quantum computer, which of course is not true. Um, <laughs> but the idea is to think through the implications so we'll be ready when that does happen. So the, the field of quantum computation is often said to have begun with uh, an observation by Feynman where he said that the full description of quantum mechanics for a large system with R particles has too many variables that cannot be simulated with a normal computer with a number of elements proportional to R. Nowadays, we would say it couldn't even be simulated with a number of elements uh, polynomial in R. And so this was sort of a, a well-known thing that quantum many-body systems are apparently exponentially hard to simulate, but he kind of turned it around and used this to suggest that maybe quantum systems uh, have exponentially more computational power than conventional um, kind of classical systems. And so this intuition was uh, borne out by subsequent developments, uh, most famously Peter Shor's spectacular 1994 discovery of a, a polynomial time quantum algorithm for factoring integers, which runs exponentially faster than the fastest known classical algorithm for this problem. And so this uh, version of history suggests a natural follow-up question, which is, are there any quantum systems that remain difficult to simulate even with a quantum computer? So it's kind of a nice problem because either way it turns out, you can get a nice paper out of it. So <laughs> if you discover a polynomial time uh, quantum algorithm for simulating some physical system, then that's great. You have a new practical algorithm that someday when we have quantum computers could do something useful. On the other hand, if you can in some way convincingly argue that some kind of physical system can't be efficiently simulated by uh, quantum computers, then maybe that means that out there in the universe there's the possibility of a new kind of computation which is even exponentially more powerful than conventional quantum computation, sort of repeating this, uh, this Feynman argument. So what do we know about quantum simulation at this point? It's a reasonably well-studied subject. And we have a lot of uh, good quantum algorithms for simulating various kinds of quantum uh, many-body systems. So in particular, there have been algorithms developed for lattice models, say the Hubbard model or whatever is your favorite thing, a bunch of, uh, say, spin glasses and whatever. If you want to simulate the dynamics of these things, uh, it's kind of known how to do that. So there was an original paper by Lloyd way back in 96, and many subsequent developments improving the, uh, the efficiency of these kinds of algorithms. Similarly, if you have the kind of quantum system that you may see as an undergrad. You have you know, a bunch of individual particles evolving through space according to um, Schrodinger's equation, basically chemistry type systems. There are also known quantum algorithms for simulating that. And these things run in time a number of computational steps and a number of qubits which both grow polynomially in the size of the system that you're simulating measured by, say, the number of particles it has, the number of degrees of freedom it has, number of lattice sites, how long you want to simulate it for, these kind of metrics. You scale polynomially with all those. And there are even more general algorithms that, that can uh, simulate broader classes of Hamiltonians, which include these sort of physically motivated ones as special cases. And people look at these for more computer science reasons. So okay, so you might say, well, okay, is, is quantum system, quantum simulation just kind of a solved problem? Do these many body uh, simulators already imply that you can simulate quantum field theories efficiently as sort of as an automatic corollary of, of what's already been, been shown? And uh, as you may have guessed by the title of this talk, I'm gonna claim that this is not a, an automatic corollary, that there's actually some interesting things to talk about uh, which I will talk about for the next uh, 40 minutes or whatever, about how to simulate quantum field theories on a quantum computer. So why might quantum field theory be different than some of the systems that have already uh, been studied? So the first reason, and, and maybe in some ways the most uh, fundamental one, is that all of these algorithms that I mentioned to you are all running in time polynomial in the number of particles, polynomial in the number of degrees of freedom. And you know, if you have, say, an electron just moving through space, you can describe its state by three numbers, just its, its coordinates, right? Whereas a field, if you're trying to describe a field even classically, in principle, you need to list its value at every point in space 
And if space, as we're assuming, is a continuum, then that's infinitely many numbers, in some sense, in infinitely many um, degrees of freedom, even within a finite volume. And so that's kind of the most fundamental difference be with uh, quantum field theory. You can't just say, well, because, uh, because we have these polynomially scaling things as a function of the number of degrees of freedom, that means we can simulate quantum field theory. Now, of course, quantum field theory is part of the motivation for their development is that they can be made Lorentz invariant. They can describe relativistic systems. Uh, the particle is not conserved. So if you have something scaling polynomially in the number of particles, that doesn't necessarily give you a good algorithm, especially if you have massless particles. You could have arbitrarily large numbers of those produced uh, in the output of a uh, scattering process. And just the formalism that we describe quantum field theory with typically involving Lagrangians instead of Hamiltonians, path integrals instead of sort of Schrodinger equation and all this kind of stuff, it just kind of looks different from our usual case. And so that suggests, you know, we have to do some thinking to see how to simulate it. <coughs> all right, so now I have two motivation slides, which are very different in character. Uh, the first one you will object to because it's too grandiose, and the second one you may object to because it's uh, too mundane. But I'll give you them both, and maybe interpolating you'll, you'll find it uh, unobjectionable. So the, the grandiose motivation is the, it's the one that especially appeals to me. And, and the question is, what is the computational power of the universe? So if you say, you know, what's the, the central question of computer science? I would say the central question of computer science is, what are the fundamental capabilities and limitations of computers? And ever since uh, Feynman and, and David Deutsch in the 80s uh, started thinking about this question, it's become clear that it can't really be answered in isolation from physics. So the early work on, on computer science was done in a purely pure thought kind of way. The mathematicians sat down and they said, all right, let's make a definition of a computer. And they drew these little Turing machines and lambda calculus and so on. But a computer actually fundamentally is not something you can just define. It's determined by the laws of physics. And, and as we now know, if you just define it, usually what you'll do is you'll get the wrong answer as to what can be computed efficiently and what cannot. You might, for example, say our definition of computing is Turing machines and factoring cannot be done in polynomial time. But now we know uh, that if you remember to take into account quantum mechanics, it can. So OK, so now we have this physical question about what computers can and cannot do. And you shouldn't forget about quantum mechanics, but you really shouldn't forget about any physics. So now you say, OK, it's a physical question. What, can we, what are the problems we can efficiently solve and which ones can we never solve, uh, no matter how much resources we have? <clears throat> and this sounds like kind of an armchair philosopher question. How do you turn it into something that you actually work on instead of just sort of pontificate about? Well, there's actually kind of a known procedure from the, uh, the computer science community to turn this into a real tractable problem that you can prove theorems about, which is the notion of reduction. So if you have two models of computation and you show that one can simulate the other efficiently and this one can simulate that one efficiently, then that gives you a notion of equivalence of these two models. You say they're equally powerful in some sense. And so we can just take that tool from the computer science community and we can say, all right, let's take some uh, model of physics, say the standard model, and we take some model of computation, say the quantum circuit model, and we say, can each one simulate the other uh, with polynomial overhead? I don't know why I put a uh, like cloud chamber diagram. It's just sort of a pictogram to represent uh, the, uh, the standard model. OK, so here's the other motivation. We have these quantum field theories. In many cases, we can do the experiments. We think we know what the underlying theory is. But we can't actually do the calculation all the way to quantitatively compare the predictions of the theory to the experiment, and because the calculations are just too hard. So that means that leaves an opportunity where if we eventually develop large-scale quantum computers someday, they could be of practical use to us to do these calculations and make these comparisons. So what is the uh, quantum computer um, competing with? What's the current state of the art as, as far as uh, classical algorithms? I would say there's basically two classical algorithms in, in current use for computing the, the dynamic, the, the computing things about quantum field theories. First one is Feynman diagrams. And you might not think of this as an algorithm because oftentimes you can actually do it by hand with pencil and paper. 
What that means is that it's actually just a very good algorithm. It's unbelievably efficient. You can actually do it with your own brain. <coughs> um, but it has its limitations. So first of all, this is a perturbative technique. So what you're doing is you're effectively expanding like a Taylor series in the powers of the coupling constant that describes the strengths of the interactions between the particles. And so if the particles are interacting strongly, if that coefficient is not small, this just won't work. So for example, in uh, quantum chromodynamics, in, in the, which describes nuclei, uh, just get nowhere uh, with this method, at least within certain energy regimes. And actually, there's another slightly more subtle point, which is maybe not as widely known, is that even in the weakly coupled case, these uh, expansions are generally not to believe to be um, convergent, but are actually just asymptotic expansions. So there's a fundamental limit to how much precision you can get with these procedures. As you take into account more and more orders, you are initially improving your estimates, but beyond a certain point, you actually make them worse. So at strong coupling or high precision, if you want to compute these scattering uh, amplitudes, uh, Feynman diagrams are not going to do it. Now there is another technique which does work just fine at strong coupling. This is uh, the lattice methods, lattice gauge theory. And this doesn't have a problem with strong coupling, but it, it also is limited because the way it works is that you go to imaginary time, you turn your unitary process into a stochastic process, you simulate it on gigantic computers. In fact, this is, you know, a huge user of you know, millions of CPU hours per year and many kilowatt hours of, uh, and many dollars. You know, this is a big industry. And what it can do, though, is because we've gone to imaginary time, you sort of drive things down into low energy states. You're not doing unitary dynamics. And so what this is good at is determining statics quantities, like binding energies and things. It doesn't do a good job of computing uh, dynamic quantities, like scattering amplitudes. So if you have something that's uh, where you are looking at strong coupling or you want really high precision and you care about dynamical quantities, neither of these methods covers that case. And that's the regime in which you can say, well, maybe here's an opportunity for quantum computers to really give an exponential advantage. And actually, there's some recent work um, trying, to trying to calculate things about strongly coupled theories. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, so, so I've been thinking of this as a classical algorithm in the sense that, yeah, you run this on a, um, on a classical computer. Another thing you could do is, well, let's take, say, uh, you know, an optical lattice with a bunch of uh, neutral atoms in it, and you try to adjust all the couplings and so on so that it mimics some, uh, some lattice gauge theory model that maybe you um, are interested in for uh, reasons of high energy physics. So that's a very interesting uh, a subject that people here are, are, are working on. And I would regard that as a form of, of quantum computing. That it's, it's kind of an analog quantum simulator. And I'll discuss that a little bit at the end. So it's, it's, it's a slightly different subject from wh what I'm going to talk about, but, but somewhat related and somewhat complementary in, in terms of what it can do. Here we're sort of looking at. Suppose in the future we have very good quantum computers and we want to scale things up. What are fundamentally are the limits of what we can achieve and what we can't achieve? With these analog things, there are some murky questions about scalability, but the nice thing about them is like we actually have these. We can do experiments and we can actually try this. So it's uh, you know it's it's also a very exciting subject. Yeah. I was made aware of the fact that there's a problem with language, which I think we just may have just seen, about what's called quantum and what's called cal uh, classical. Uh -huh. uh, I was just in, in, um, in Oxford attending two different quantum <laughs> meetings. But uh, what, what um, we used to call quantum Monte Carlo uh -huh. is a classical yeah. uh, uh, simulation of quantum mechanics. And so when you say quantum, and I think what people generally mean when they say quantum now is there's going to be quantum hardware. Right, yeah. yeah. That's so, what I will mean. So that's probably one of the reasons for some confusion here. <laughs> uh huh. Thanks. OK, and now there's some very new kind of underdevelopment work about using some sort of string theory related techniques to <laughs> calculate things in strongly coupled field theories. Um, it's not exactly clear where all that's going to go, but I don't think anyone believes that it's going to give you polynomial time algorithms for all uh, scattering uh, 
problems in quantum field theory. It's sort of very much under development. And it's also a little bit removed from real physics. They're kind of assuming very idealized specific models that are not quite the ones we really want to solve. That's an interesting thing, but I won't really comment on it. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, those are my motivation slides, and now let me tell you a little bit more um, of what we're doing. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the, I'll put on my computer scientist hat, and, and like there are certain best practices that you should use when you're a computer scientist, just kind of like how in physics you're always supposed to be careful, make sure the dimensions work out on your equations and so on. There's simil similar things for computer science, they have that too, and one of them is you should really specify a pretty concrete definition of your computational problem before you start talking about it. Otherwise, you'll get very confused. Um, you know, and simulate quantum field theory doesn't, qu doesn't cut it. <clears throat> so, okay, so what's our computational problem? This is not like a really detailed definition, but it's good enough for a slide. So what we're gonna look at is an idealized scattering problem. We take two particles, they're well separated, they're in nice little wave packet states with fairly well-defined momentum, we let them go, some dynamics happens, they collide, some particles come out. We want to know how many particles are going to come out, what kinds will they be, and what momenta will they have. And because this is a quantum dynamics, it's probabilistic, there's some probability distribution over possible outcomes. What we're going to demand from our computer is to sample from that probability distribution. So the, the, uh, the classical algorithms that do this are called event generators by the, uh, by the high energy people. <coughs> And so our inputs list of these momenta particles coming in, output lists of momenta coming out. And I think this is a fairly natural problem. I think a theorist would uh, say, oh, well, this is more or less the problem of computing an S matrix. And an experimentalist would say, well, this is at least some very cartoonish caricature of what we do in the accelerators. So yeah. say it's an event model. So if I have a very low probabilistic, probabilistic outcome, I'm going to have to run my computer many times to likely sample that. Right. And it's not clear, so if you demanded something like uh, from your quantum computer that you s pick some particular outcome and you say, I want the quantum computer to tell me the probability of this to some number of digits. It's not so clear that this, you should expect that a quantum computer should be able to solve that problem in polynomial time. Some of these um, arguments about uh, um, boson sampling and, and so on suggest that if you demand more detailed information about this probability distribution, you may actually be, in some cases, asking for too much. An experiment only gives you this and, uh, and will only demand this much from, from our simulation. Um, but there are maybe some interesting questions there. <coughs> okay, so that's what we're trying to do, and then how do we do it and what are the obstacles that we face when trying to do it? So first of all, we want to look at simple examples. If you start right away saying, all right, let's simulate the standard model, it's an unbelievable amount of physics that you have to, first of all, learn and, and second of all, deal with lots of technical difficulties. So we're going to look at kind of simplified models. We'll look at two of them, one bosonic, one fermionic, in both cases involving massive particles. And the ones we picked are called 5-4 theory and the, Gro and the massive Gross-Neva model. And these are kind of standard textbook examples and we pick them essentially for the same reasons the textbook writers pick them. They're not too complicated, but they capture a lot of the essence of, of many key uh, physical phenomena and, and sort of formalistic aspects of, of quantum field theory. So what we've done is we've uh, uh, devised and, and analyzed the performance of some quantum algorithms for simulating scattering processes in these two theories. And so what are the obstacles that you face when um, uh, trying to simulate these theories, well, you just get this kind of uh, laundry list of sort of things that kind of look like maybe boring technical issues. One is discretizing space time and bounding the errors that you get from discretization. One is, well, how do you prepare the initial states for your simulation? <clears throat> and another one is, well, what sorts of observables do you measure at the end to learn something about what scattering has gone on? But actually, it, it turns out that each of these things, which kind of look like just irritating and, and mundane, uninteresting technical issues, really do plunge you into some very interesting physics uh, pretty rapidly. So this issue of discretizing space-time 
uh, plunges you into the physics of renormalization, which is kind of a, one of the key things about uh, quantum field theory, which was, which was new and which was not familiar from the, the quantum mechanics that came before it. Preparing initial states, uh, this, this issue is maybe the most interesting part of our project from a computer science point of view. And here, measuring physically meaningful observables, it actually raised some kind of interesting physical questions about vacuum entanglement and, and things like that. So each of these things that look like annoyances actually turned out to be quite intriguing. All right, so here's the Lagrangian of 5 4 theory. I'll just show it to you. Um, you can also equivalently write it as a Hamiltonian. These things are, are little uh, Hermitian operators. They have canonical commutation relations. If you were to discretize space, this would basically look like a bunch of harmonic oscillators uh, coupled to each other, except that each one has like a slight anharmonicity to it. And that's, that anharmonicity is what ultimately causes particles to interact. So this is the first theory we looked at. Um, you don't necessarily have to read this slide, but I thought I would throw it up there in case anyone's interested. <clears throat> OK, so now we want to represent our quantum fields on the quantum computer. And then once we figure out how to represent them with qubits, then we can start to think about how to implement their dynamics. So what is a field? So classically, a field is described by its uh, value at every point in space. So you have some configuration, maybe a couple of point charges. You have some corresponding field value as a function of spatial coordinates. And so quantum field, same idea, except now you can have a superposition over different uh, field configurations. So here, our, I've called the field E. For each field configuration E, we have a wave functional, which for every functional form that E could take associates some amplitude. Then the full state is some superposition, so we have to integrate over some measure over different uh, functions. You know, what is that measure, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of technical issues, but that's kind of the, the rough idea of what we're trying to represent on a quantum computer. So now let's think about what happens if we discretize space. So now if we have a field, just a classical field, and we've discretized space, now we just have to specify its values at a bunch of points. So we have like, say, space is two-dimensional. We just have these little pixels. We write down the pixel values. That's a classical field state. Quantum mechanically, then we just have superpositions over that. So here's an example, some particular superposition over different field states. And of course, I've written these things by little grayscale colors. In principle, the field value at each point of space is a uh, continuous variable, but the thing you always do is you represent these with finitely many bits of precision. So you write down little bit strings, one for each point in space. So now this superposition over different field configurations is a superposition over long bunches of strings. In other words, it's the state of a bunch of qubits. The state of qubits is a superposition over different bit strings. So this is the basic idea of how we're going to store a field configuration on our quantum computer. And of course, we've discretized things. And you introduce some errors when you do so. And what you always hope is that as you take your lattice spacing smaller and smaller, then there's some limit where you approach the continuum. And in, in some sense, uh, some people would say, the sort of constructive quantum field theory people would say, that a, a quantum field theory, fundamentally what it is, is a limit of a sequence of theories on successively finer lattices. And that's, whether you agree with that as a, a fundamental definition or not, that's the approach we're going to take from a practical point of view on our computing. Yeah. Like a uh, um, Bekenstein bound and holographic limits, these kind of things, or yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're not going to assume that we're going to take these quantum field theories as kind of like, yeah, we know that there's gravity in the universe, and so these quantum field theories as mathematical objects unto themselves don't describe everything. But to the extent that they're consistent mathematical objects, that's what we're going to deal with. We'll forget about gravity. And in some ways, this makes things harder. And in some ways, it makes things easier. Um, it makes things harder maybe because 
because of these gravitational effects, there might actually be some fundamental cutoff at, say, the Planck scale, and really there's only finitely much information in the universe. Uh, so, so maybe that actually helps you in simulating things. On the other hand, it makes things much harder because no one really understands quantum gravity, and it's a huge uh, can of worms, and certainly I don't understand it. So we're just going to take quantum field theories unto themselves. We will take some cutoff. We'll put the cutoff at some scale which is appropriate to the problem we're solving, and typically this cutoff scale is going to be much uh, coarser than the Planck scale, and that will save us qubits. Right. So, so that was done by the lattice yeah. So a lot of the so the mathematical tools that we're going to use for analyzing our um, uh, our discretization errors are really the same ones that were used by like Semanzik in the '70s when he was talking about lattice gauge theory. There are slight differences because we're um, discretizing um, only space and not time in some sense, but roughly we're just kind of borrowing that machinery. Their fundamental topological abstractions to it. Ah, I see. So, anyway, so, so it's, it's much less of a technicality. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So, what, what you're talking about now resembles um, you know, the treatment of quantum field theory that has been done in practice. The, the underlying formalism is that of standard quantum field theory. And yeah. Yeah, so our, our hope when in embarking on this project was that by thinking about quantum field theory using a quantum information perspective, we might gain new insights into quantum field theory itself. Um, but so far that, I mean, we haven't really achieved that, so uh, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. So when you no say reason not to try. Yeah, <laughs> we're still trying, yeah. When you say you're going to have a, a cutoff, that, well, there's a certain amount of momentum in the system, and I should cut it off at something that corresponds to something smaller than the inverse of that momentum, or is there, is there more to it? There's, I mean, that is the, the essence of it, but there's slightly more, because we also, in addition to like a momentum scale for the system, for the process we're simulating, there's also a level of precision we want. And so we do some fairly detailed calculations where for a given momentum, if you want more precision, you have to set your cutoff further above the momentum that you're studying. <coughs> now, when you take this continuum limit, something actually very interesting happens, which is maybe unfamiliar from classical physics. So like, let's suppose you know, you're just doing an integral, and you can make it as a Riemann sum, and you take your little boxes smaller and smaller, and it just converges, and, then, and that's how you can define integrals. <coughs> You might hope that the same thing would happen just as straightforwardly in quantum field theory. But it's actually not quite so straightforward as that. As it turns out, and this is kind of the, the essence of renormalization, sort of the, the Wilsonian view of it, is that as you take this lattice spacing smaller and smaller, in order to converge to a limit of some interacting quantum field theory at a fixed scale, you need to make the parameters of your lattice model vary as a function of the lattice spacing. And this is this renormalization issue. These parameters m and lambda, which we sort of thought of having to do with the particle mass and the particle interaction strength, we have to vary them as a function of this uh, um, lattice spacing in order to get a limit to come out. And that's kind of this new and funny and, and technically tricky thing about, uh, about this continuum limit version of uh, quantum field theory. So, it's perhaps easier to think about it if you think about it the other way. So suppose you fundamentally do have some lattice theory on some fine-grained lattice. You have some lattice Hamiltonian on there, which is sort of like on-site things and nearest neighbor couplings and some more on-site terms. And then you say, all right, let's integrate out in some sense some of these degrees of freedom and get some coarse-grained theory and write down an effective Hamiltonian governing the dynamics of that. This is a fairly well-defined procedure. <coughs> 
And if you do that, what typically happens is you get a new lattice model, which looks quite similar to the one you started with. You have all the same kinds of terms in there, but the coefficients in front of them take new values, which depend on the old values and on how much you've coarse grained uh, your lattice. And then in addition to that, you may also have some new terms, some new effective couplings, which are more complicated. And if you have a, a renormalizable quantum field theory and you've included all the relevant terms already, then these things are going to be small. And when you do a lattice cutoff, if you were thinking about discretization errors, these terms, which we're not including in our model, but which in principle one must include to get everything exact, those are the errors. Those are our, the, the, the scaling of these terms um, determine the scaling of our, our discretization errors in, in um, our simulation. And how these uh, little terms vary as a function of uh, lattice spacing is something that's been well studied in quantum field theory. It's, you have kind of a, a flow through a Hamiltonian space, which is called the renormalization group flow, and you can figure out how these, uh, how these coefficients scale as a function of lattice spacing. You can normally guess the answer by dimensional analysis, and, uh, but we've also done the detailed calculation, in, which confirms kind of the dimensional analysis answer. And what we find in the specific case of phi 4 theory is that our simulation converges quadratically as we decrease the lattice spacing. The fine. So we have some fixed coarse lattice, some fixed momentum scale of the phenomena that we're interested in, and then we sort of make a fine lattice, which is sort of overkill from that. And as we make it more and more overkill, our discretization errors get smaller and smaller quadratically. Uh, now, is that a convergence, let's say, at a fixed time convergence on the, the grid itself? Because I think if you reduce the grid size, you also Maybe they, I guess in a relativistic field theory, you reduce the time size and you get the convergence of that. Well, yeah, I mean, so there's a question of exactly what you mean when you specify the precision of the theory. So, like, suppose you have some Hamiltonian with an extra term in it that's small. Now, if, if your notion of precision is, I want the unitary time evolution to, like, match the exact one, like the difference of them has small operator norm or something, then if you have this pair of Hamiltonians whose difference is small, the difference in the unitaries is going to scale with how long you're simulating for. And so that's a very stringent notion of uh, uh, precision, which is not the one that I'm kind of invoking here. Here I'm saying, let's say we want to know some scattering um, cross-section to 1%. Then you don't really need uh, the, uh, the unitaries to, to match. They can you know, be quite far off in, in operator norm but they're sort of capturing the same physics. So that's, that's the notion of precision that we're using. Okay, so, so far I've been motivating this from the point of view of uh, simulating high energy physics, but the same ideas can be used, uh, you know, as you know, quantum field theory is very widely used in uh, condensed matter physics. There you fundamentally do have a cutoff, say the lattice spacing, but nevertheless, you might care about physics, which is at length scales very long compared to the lattice spacing, in which case you're better off just sort of approximating things, thinking of it as being like a continuum. Afterwards, you want to calculate something on a computer, you're going to go back and in induce a fictitious lattice spacing because you need a cutoff, but that fictitious lattice spacing could be much larger than the fundamental lattice spacing, and so you can save a lot of effort this way. You can use fewer bits, fewer qubits, whatever, to do your computation. So, so even though there's a fundamental cutoff, you may set your cutoff lower, and you can use this renormalization group flow arguments to understand what your discretization errors really are in this. So you could, you know, it's basically the same uh, conversation I had with uh, Alan about, uh, you know, a fundamental gravity cutoff might not really be the cutoff you want to use in high energy physics. Okay, <coughs> so that's basically all I want to say about um, discretization and renormalization, and then we'll just go back to this list. And before going on to the next step of this list, yeah. No, I have a difficult time, but this time I have a question about uh, the field. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so that's another thing we have um, some calculations about in our, in our paper. So you have, you know, it's like a harmonic oscillator. It can, it's a continuous variable. We're going to write down its, its value with some finite number of bits just using place value, you know, on a, on a quantum computer. And that in induces some error as well. And we, we bound those errors in a non-perturbative way. It's actually, that's actually a lot easier than, than bounding the, um, uh, the discretization errors because each time you add one more bit to your floating, your, you know, fixed point representation of this continuous variable, you're doubling your number of, say, lattice points, so to speak, to represent this variable discreetly. So even if you get a very coarse on these, uh, um, uh, dis those kind of discretization errors, that's good enough because you can just throw in some 10 more bits and now you've improved things by a factor of 1,000 and, and, and things scale pretty favorably. So there we have a very coarse bound, but which is very general and, and rigorous, uh, whereas on the renormalization stuff, it's not completely rigorous. It's using sort of standard physics techniques, and, and uh, you know, it's a little bit more specific to a particular theory. So, but yeah, so that is another issue you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. While well, we're asking all these questions, um, you haven't mentioned anything about boundary conditions, and those could be mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. Things like Milstein Minimia theorem and things like this. Yeah. Right. Do, do you have anything to say about boundary conditions? Um, so for us, for these projects, we just put everything onto a torus, and we just made the torus big enough so that uh, you know we're not having particles wrap around and hit each other again, basically. Um, and as far as Nielsen anomia and all that stuff, so there's this well-known problem in the lattice uh, classical lattice gauge theory community, um, classical in the classical computing sense, um, about uh, fermion doubling and uh, what happens when you have chiral symmetries. And so that's kind of on our to-do list of things to work with. Neither of these theories that we've worked with so far have that problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here's our list of things to deal with. Um, before going on to the next one, I'll draw your attention to something that's not on this list, which is simulating the actual dynamics. And the reason that's not on this list is because that's the part of the problem where we really can kind of just use the standard techniques that are from the many-body simulation uh, literature. Once we've discretized things, it's just a many-body system. We kind of use standard techniques, which are, are trotter formulas, if, if you're familiar with it. But anyway, there's basically just kind of known ways to take time evolution of many-body systems and break them down into a sequence of little um, few qubit unitary gates. So I'll really just comment on, on the next two issues, preparing initial states and measuring observables. So here's the Trotter formulas. Basically, you just kind of chop up your Hamiltonian into little bits and simulate them one by one. OK. So what's the overall uh, sweep of the algorithm? So how do we prepare the initial states? Well, the initial state, even the vacuum state in a quantum field theory and in interacting quantum field theory is something pretty complicated. We don't even have like an analytical expression for it. So what we do is, is what people always like to do is let's go back to the free theory. The free theory is just a bunch of harm, coupled harmonic oscillators. We can solve everything exactly. We know everything about it. So we'll start with that. So if we turn off the lambda coefficient, we just have no non-interacting particles, free theory, harmonic oscillators. We can solve for the ground state, the vacuum state, which is a high dimensional Gaussian superposition. There are known techniques for uh, preparing Gaussian superpositions in high dimensions on quantum computers that were worked out by Bravi and Kataev. So we just use that. Then we have the non-interacting vacuum. But we don't want to simulate vacuum. We want to simulate particles. So we can create some particles. We basically excite them resonantly. So now we have two particles in the, in the free theory. Now we want to turn on the particle interactions somehow so that we can simulate actual scattering processes and not just particles blindly passing by each other, which is very uninteresting. <clears throat> so we turn on the interactions adiabatically. That's slowly, in, people use the language that dresses the particles with the cloud of virtual particles. The vacuum now becomes the interacting vacuum. The scattering happens. And then at the end, we actually consider two things. One is we measure sort of local observables of energy or charge. 
The other thing is you can just reverse this process, go adiabatically back to the non-interacting theory where you understand any, everything. You can measure actual number operators of these harmonic oscillator modes uh, and learn your S matrix. <clears throat> so that's the basic essence of what we do. Yeah, so, well, it exists up to a certain point. So here's like a, a cartoon version of a phase diagram of 5-4 theory. And say you have a fixed value of the bare mass and you increase the coupling strength more and more. Eventually, there is a quantum phase transition which uh, spontaneously breaks the phi to minus phi symmetry. And right there, the mass gap vanishes. And so you can't adiabatically cross that phase transition. And so we just said, OK, well, that's out of, out of scope for this paper. We're just going <laughs> to, we're going to simulate everything in this symmetric phase. Uh, OK. But so that's, that, that's one issue that's important. Now, there's another issue. So OK, the idea is we make some time-dependent Hamiltonian. We have some parameter s. We can vary s as a function of time. This parameter is sort of like a knob that we turn to turn on the the anharmonicities, or in other words, the particle interactions. And that's the idea. And so this is almost a good idea, except you run into a problem. The problem is we're not preparing an eigenstate of the system. We've, got, we've made wave packets. This is a superposition over different eigenstates. They have different energies. As you time evolve, they'll accrue different dynamical phases. So something's happening there. A more physical way of putting it is, Time evolution is happening. These are wave packets. What do wave packets do? They propagate and they broaden. And both of those things are bad for our simulation. If we have these wave packets propagating toward each other while we're still turning on the interaction, they may collide with each other too early before we've even got the interaction turned all the way on. Now maybe you can compensate for that by making really long runways <coughs> so that they have time to propagate while they're being dressed. But that's very costly in terms of number of qubits. It's not something we really want to do. And then if the other problem is if the, uh, um, the wave packets broaden, now there are these very diffuse clouds. And so even if they're sitting right on top of each other, the expected distance between the particles is not necessarily small. So your scattering probability can still be low. And then you, know, you have to run the statistics to see something. Now you have to run the statistics a really long time before you see anything. <laughs> So this is bad. <clears throat> so, so this is a simulation where we're allowed to do things in a computer simulation that are completely unphysical. Uh, you can never do in nature, and we sort of take advantage of this. What we do is we intersperse backwards time evolutions. So it's kind of like you know, your wave packets have uh, propagated and broadened a little too much. Just hop in your time machine and undo it. And in a simulation, you can do that. So the, the essence is. We do forward time evolution where this coupling strength is gradually being ramped up. And then we do a little backward time evolution with constant coupling strength, and then forward ramping up and backward constant, and forward ramping up and backward constant. And what you find is that if you make these little time steps small enough, it converges to a process where the adiabatic change of basis still proceeds as before, but these dynamical phases get canceled out by our little backwards time evolutions. So you can really prepare wave packets kind of in place. The particles are getting dressed. The vacuum is changing to the interacting vacuum. But the wave packets aren't really broadening or propagating. They're just kind of jiggling in place as we do these time steps. Yeah? So this seems really clever. Thanks. Sounds like there ought to be a cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's not especially efficient. So uh, in a few slides from now, I'll show you what the uh, um, complexity of our algorithm is. And we get a polynomial time algorithm. So everything is scaling as some power of our momentum and everything like that. But if you look at what these powers are, we're getting numbers like six. You know, it's not so good uh, from a practical point of view. Um, and in most regimes, it's actually this state preparation step, which is the dominant cost. And so now we're working on improving that. So the, the kind of in standard computer science intuition is once you find a polynomial time algorithm for some problem, even if the power is like some ridiculous thing like seven or so, an actual practical algorithm is not too far behind. So, uh, and actually, uh, 
And so actually we're working on that. So I have a, a collaboration right now with Rolando Somo where we're developing a more efficient uh, state preparation method uh, right now. <coughs> okay, and here's what I said about the <coughs> phase transition. So 5-4 theory, you know, you shouldn't take this line seriously. I drew it myself just by knowing it has a negative slope here and that it must exist out here somewhere. Um, but uh, uh, so this is my pretend phase diagram. And so we can simulate stuff in here. Um, and maybe the most interesting thing to simulate, as I've argued at the beginning, is right close to the phase transition. That's sort of the strongly coupled regime. That's where perturbation theory is really not going to cut it. And you really have uh, an opportunity to get an exponential speed up uh, by quantum computing. That's where the problem gets especially hard. And how close you are to the phase transition in your simulation also affects the uh, quantum algorithm because the mass gap is vanishing at this phase transition and your adiabatic state preparation, if you remember these sort of quantitative versions of the adiabatic theorem, how long it takes to prepare a state scales like one over the square of the mass gap. And so here the mass gap is vanishing, and so it's taking longer to prepare these states. It's kind of like, um, well, anyway, that's what happens. So, so uh, how the mass gap vanishes here is known uh, from the statistical mechanics community, sort of non-perturbative arguments. And there are these things called the critical exponents, which tells you how the mass scales with how close you are to this critical value of the coupling constant. And for one and two spatial dimensions, which are the cases where this uh, phase transition exists. Those are what the, uh, the exponents are. And so the nice thing here is, okay, we've got these exponents. We multiply them by two because we've got one over the gap squared. We're still getting polynomial scaling with how, with how uh, close to the phase transition we're simulating. Okay, so that's, uh, that's state preparation. What about measurements? So there's two different uh, kinds of measurements we looked at. Maybe the more interesting one is, yeah. Sure. So this wouldn't work for gapless QED, like gapless phase being pure fusion speed. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's one of the most interesting open problems in this program, I think, is how are we going to simulate the massless theories? Uh, so one thing you might want to do to detect um, things at the very end of your computation is, well, let's just do something that's kind of like a very cartoonized, idealized version of a detector that you might see in a real um, accelerator experiment. You kind of make these little pixels and you measure the energy in each one and you see where particles are based on that. So that's one thing we considered and we found something very funny about this. So you have some uh, uh, lattice theory, you say, okay, what's, what's a good operator to measure the local energy, you say, okay, well, let's just take this lattice theory and like set all the terms to zero outside of some little region and keep all the terms on the lattice sites inside that region, and that's what we measure. This actually doesn't work because uh, what you find is that um, it's, it's too sensitive to vacuum fluctuations. So you look at the uh, variance of this uh, operator the vacuum state and it's divergent, it's what they call ultraviolet divergent, it, the vacuum fluctuations are getting worse and worse as you make the um, uh, lattice spacing smaller. <coughs> and it's kind of a funny phenomenon. What I think it has to do with ultimately is actually in vacuum entanglement. So if you look at the, some region of the vacuum, it's entangled with the rest, it's reduced density matrix is going to be a highly mixed state and so it's not a huge surprise that a lot of observables that you might define on little local regions will have large variances in the vacuum state. Um, and these, these entanglement entropies are generally ultraviolet divergent. So I think maybe it's capturing some, some interesting physics. We don't understand it from a very deeper fundamental point of view yet. We've just, we can do these calculations and that's what we find. There's a way around it, which is that you kind of put smooth envelope uh, uh, functions on your lattice. So instead of saying like, we have the terms turned on here and zero outside. We like make a Gaussian envelope. And empirically, when we do our calculations, OK, that seems to work. We don't, it kind of makes sense because you're, by smoothing edges, you're less sensitive to sh short range Fourier modes. But this is just something we, we find interesting. We don't have a fundamental understanding. We can kind of 
calculate case by case. It seems like an interesting thing we've stumbled across. So here's my promise complexity slide. Um, what, uh, what red means is that the uh, adiabatic state preparation is the dominant cost. What blue means is that the preparing the free vacuum is actually the dominant cost. And we measure according to different parameters. Here, epsilon is our precision parameter and the weak coupling, so we look at scaling with that. Strong coupling, we look at scaling with momentum, number of outgoing particles, and how close we are to the phase transition. And you can see there's lots of terrible exponents here, but it's all polynomial. <coughs> Okay, and we did fermions. Uh, a few new things come up. There is something called the fermion doubling problem. Uh, basically, the problem is that your dispersion goes back to zero at the edge of your Brillouin zone. Um, you can fix that in, in theories that don't have chiral symmetry by just adding a new second derivative term that kind of doesn't affect what's down at the bottom in the low momentum here and gets rid of this extra minimum, which corresponds to an extra particle species. This is called the Wilson term. It's an old trick from the lattice gauge theory people, and we just adopt that. And if you don't have chiral symmetry, that works fine. So that's basically what I want to say about uh, the fermionic case. And maybe this is actually kind of a, a, a good pl place to stop. So in our eventual goal is that we would like to simulate the entire standard model. We've looked at a few toy theories. Can we simulate the whole thing? As has been mentioned, one of the main, one of, there are a number of uh, open questions about this, including especially the case of mass, massive particles uh, and chiral fermions. I guess this is an outdated slide. Uh, this uh, bound state issue, we, we kind of understand how to measure, do measurements so we see uh, bound states. And we also are working on a kind of a complementary question to try to show that classical computers can't solve this problem efficiently. Um, but, uh, but I think I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs>